Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk using the Power Platform to extend finance and operations apps part two common data service. My name is Evan and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation and by participating in the session using Microsoft Teams, your name, email address, phone number, and or title may be viewable by other session participants. If you do not consent to being part of a recorded session, please disconnect at this time. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout and at the end of the event. If you would like to turn on closed captions during this event, click on the CC button on the lower right side of your screen and use the gear icon to select your preferred language. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Now let's get started. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Rachel Profit, Senior Program Manager, and Jeff Anderson, Principal Software Engineer. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Evan, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be joining from. I'm super excited to be here with part two of our Using the Power Platform series. For those of you who do not know me, again, my name is Rachel Profit. Um, my contact information here um, on the, the screen for you. Uh, I encourage you to connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or you can follow me on my blog at dynamics365lady.com. So in today's session, we've got uh, some really exciting demos lined up for you. Um, and we're going to be talking about really kind of three pillars around the common data service. I'm going to be showing you how to use dual write, data integrator, and virtual entities together in the same environment in an end-to-end -end scenario um, with Power Apps portals, Power Apps model-driven apps, um, Power Automate, um, and all of this is built on top of that common data service. We're going to talk about pros and cons, do's and don'ts for each of the different technologies with the common data service and how you use these tools to integrate um, and build extensions and solutions on top of finance and ops. And we've also got a variety of learning resources for you um, in the deck. And there's also two appendixes at the end of the deck that will be available for you after um, the, the session once the recording is available. And I encourage you to take a look at those additional resources that we've compiled for you today. So getting started um, with the common data service. Um, many of you are probably already aware that um, dual right uh, you know it's been around for a little while now um, but it's that tightly coupled bi-directional near real-time integration with finance and operations and your common data service virtual entities is the new player to the game um, and there's a, a tech talk coming up in about two weeks that's going to deep dive into this topic um, i'm just going to be kind of highlighting use cases and talking a little bit about how you use it and when you use it um, but these virtual entities um, put all of your finance and operations data in the common data service. Um, and the data integrator is, um, you know, the oldest player in the game, if you will. Um, and this is our point-to-point -point asynchronous integration tool. So um, kind of getting started with the comparison of these three tools, the first thing that I want to point out, and if you take nothing else away from this, is um, none of these tools are are replacing um, anything, right? Th these tools are all meant to be complementary. So um, in the demonstration today, you're going to see all three of them working together in the same environment. Um, there are definitely some caveats, like when you should use each tool and some scenarios where um, you would want to make sure that you're not using um, the tools in a conflicting way. And we'll talk more about that as we really dive in. But when we think about the three different tools, there are a variety of attributes and characteristics of these uh, tools that are important to understand. And these attributes will help you uh, pick the right tool 
um, and the right technique for integrating or extending your solution. So the first one is speed. With dual write, it's near real time. Um, with virtual entities, um, we are, are making real time CRUD operation calls. Um, and the data integrator is a scheduled recurrence. So it's not intended to be uh, used in scenarios where you need near real time uh, data or near real time updates. From a methodology standpoint, um, dual write is synchronous and data integrator is asynchronous. And you'll notice that virtual entities are marked as not applicable. And this is because virtual entities are not actually in integration technology. Virtual entities um, in a oversimplified kind of definition are just querying the data and the data actually lives in the source database inside of finance and operations. So we're not actually synchronizing any data um, with the use of virtual entities. The same thing is true of the direction. So because we aren't copying any data, um, there's no direction to the virtual entities. But when I use um, dual write, bidirectional um, means that uh, I can update those records in either finance and operations or in the common data service. But when we think about the data integrator, it is only one directional. For each particular entity that you're working with, you can only synchronize that entity in one direction, either from finance and operations to the common data service or vice versa, from the common data service into finance and operations. Um, when we think about the actual data, and I kind of mentioned this before, um, with dual write, that data is actually duplicated. And the same is true of data integrator. So it'll be important to consider that duplication of data because I'm now storing the exact same data in two different databases, and the database size limits will apply to both of those systems. However, when we use virtual entities, that data will remain in the source system um, in, inside of finance and operations. So from a database capacity, standpoint, you only need to be concerned with the size of your finance and operations database. From a logic standpoint, um, there are quite a few differences in kind of how business logic is executed with the three technologies. And this is one of the key decision points or pivot points in your decision making process when you're deciding which technology to use. So with dual right, we have automatic business logic execution and that business logic actually happens on both sides, both in finance and operations and in the common data service. So for example, if you have a required field in the common data service on a particular entity like an account, um, that field would be required even when you're updating a customer, for example, in finance and operations. So if um, that field is not populated or it isn't mapped in some sort of way, you, the user would actually receive an error message back in finance and operations indicating that that field is required. And the same is true of, of the opposite um, with finance and operations. With virtual entities, um, we do have the ability to call OData actions through um, like a, an Azure Logic app or a, um, a Power Automate or by uh, writing custom extensions, but it's not an automatic process for that business logic to be executed. And when we think about the data integrator, that business logic sits outside of the data integrator. So uh, the data integrator is really the mechanism for moving the data. And if we have business logic requirements, we handle those outside of the data integrator. There's still certain logic that is um, validated like uh, required fields and so on with all of these technologies because um, we are writing those records back into whatever those backing tables are. So um, if you have failed to you know, fill out a required field or you've put an invalid value into a particular field, those types of validations will still occur. From a size standpoint, when you're thinking about the integration um, or how you're going to be using this extension point, um, from a dual write standpoint, it's using OData, um, you know, behind the scenes to kind of write um, those records. And so it works well for single transactions. Um, on the 
contrary, data integrator is designed and specifically um, targeted towards those bulk transaction scenarios when we have lots and lots of records that need to be updated. The same is true of virtual entities. If you were trying to use virtual entities to mass update many records, you um, would likely run into some performance issues, much like you might with dual write. Um, and with dual write, we we typically recommend if you're doing like a large data migration, for example, when you're just getting started with your system, that we usually recommend that you turn dual write off um, while you're doing that in, um, you know, import. Um, because otherwise it's making, um, you know, a lot of these OData calls and that performance can be uh, degraded. Um, from a change tracking standpoint, there are some differences as well, and this is important to understand from the common data service side of things. So with dual write, um, an entity actually exists. It's, it is a, a physical entity inside of the common data service, and we do support the use of change tracking. Change tracking on an entity can enable um, a lot of different behaviors on an entity in the common data service, um, including things like audit logging, the ability to have a trigger through Power Automate or Logic Apps. Um, it also changes the behavior of how the caching works if you're using that particular entity in a Power Portal, for example. However, with virtual entities, you cannot use change tracking. And so what that means is that we do not have a mechanism to trigger a Power Automate or a Logic App when those CRUD operations occur. Um, one thing to note, though, is that we do have a feature on our roadmap that is up and coming um, to support the concept of business events in the common data service, much like we do for finance and operations. So today we... Um, we can't you know, have a trigger based on a record being created, updated, or deleted um, in finance and operations. And the same is true of those virtual entities. But with the addition of the new feature that's coming soon with um, business events for the common data service, you will be able to create those triggers and um, call those triggers uh, using Power Automate or Power uh, or Logic Apps rather. And the data integrator as well does support change tracking because again, that entity is a physical entity or a native entity that does exist in the common data service. So um, these are the features and the considerations that you'll wanna make when you think about the business requirements to determine which technology is best for your particular situation. So before I jump into the demo, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to demo in the scenario. Uh, so for some background to start out this scenario, in my environment, I have dual write configured for the entire order to cash scenario, along with companies, which is syncing over my vendors and customers. Um, and I do have some other entities enabled as well for dual write in my environment. I'm not going to be going into a lot of detail on that, but if you do have questions about dual write, I encourage you to check out the tech talk uh, that we did on dual write and the link to that is in the, the resources in the appendix of my uh, deck that will be provided. Uh, for this scenario, uh, we're using an end-to-end -end purchasing um, or procurement type scenario with an open bidding process. Um, in my environment, I did enable the public sector configuration key, but similar results could be achieved without the public sector key um, using the basic request for quotation functionality. You would just need to leverage different entities and the buttons and some of the things are maybe a little bit different when you don't have the public sector configuration key enabled. Um, the other thing to point out is that I started from the partner portal template that is available in Power Apps. Um, and so that is a template that's available that when you start to create a new one, you can just pick that template. Another option that you could use is to start from the supplier management sample portal. That portal is not available directly in Power Apps as a template. However, you can download and install that template for free. Um, it's a solution that you'll need to install in your environment um, that it, you can get from uh, GitHub um, with, um, you know, without any uh, Username or I without any uh, 
I can't think of the word. Um, anyways, so uh, we start this scenario out by publishing RFQs out to the portal um, by using virtual entities. So I've enabled a handful of virtual entities um, in my finance and operations environment in and my uh, related common data service. Um, and uh, when I create those RFQs, they automatically appear out in the portal. Um, then I've got vendors and prospective vendors who can go browse that public portal site and see the details. For my demo, I just built out a very simple page that shows the list of open bids, and you can click to view the details or the lines of each of those bids. On the same page, I also inserted a form to sign up to be a prospective vendor. This would not need to be on the same page, but for simplicity sake of the demo, I just created a single page. Um, and again, th those prospective vendors are a virtual entity. Um, at this point, you could do several different things uh, from your scenario, but for my example and my demo to help again keep it simple, um, I'm assuming that the buyer reaches out to that vendor um, and starts a purchase requisition process. But you could um, just as easily enable a number of additional entities um, that allow vendors to sign into the portal and actually create and edit those bids directly on the portal. Um, you could also use the out-of-the-box vendor collaboration portal uh, that supports that functionality as well. Um, so um, after we have kind of started this process, what I did was I created a model-driven app to make the process for the buyer easier. Let's say my buyers are oftentimes not at their desks and they're using uh, tablets uh, to, to process um, you know, a lot of their transactions. So they might be at a trade show, they might be out in the warehouse and need to create those purchase requisitions or purchase orders um, and so on. So I created a, a simple model-driven app that allows my buyers to uh, view, create, and update those purchase requisitions. And again, I'm using virtual entities in that model-driven app. Uh, for my vendors, I again was using the dual right, so um, the buyer has the ability to edit those vendors uh, or make changes to those and those directly from the model driven app and those changes would come straight through to finance and operations. Uh, for the model driven app, um, again, I enabled virtual entities for the header and lines of the purchase requisitions and the dual right for the vendors. In order to make all of that work, I did have to create some new views and forms, and I'll be uh, kind of talking through that in a little bit more detail. So kind of picking up where that scenario left off from the uh, purchase requisition side, we now need to start processing those approved POs. So those POs would go through whatever workflow process or approval processes that you might have configured in finance and operations. Um, and in my scenario, I'm assuming that we're using a third party warehouse management system. So I configured the data integrator to push products purchase order headers and lines out into uh, my fictitious WMS system. In my case, I'm just pointing it to another CDS environment, but that could have just as easily been a SQL server or any other data source that the data integrator supports. Um, in my case, the integration is scheduled to run nightly to push those approved purchase orders out to the WMS. And theoretically, I'd also need to create an inbound integration for the warehouse management system to indicate when products are received to post that transaction. And this could be done using a recurring integration with data management, for example, but I won't be showing that as a part of my demo. Once those purchase orders are received, then we start getting those invoices in from our vendors. And so for my example, I'm using a Power Automate that listens for emails or is triggered by emails being received to a specific email address and sends those through to um, a SharePoint library and uses a Canvas app that has been embedded into finance and operations. Um, to process that actual invoice. I'll be sharing a video, a short video of this um, when we get to that point in the demo, um, and we'll be diving into this particular piece of the scenario in more detail in a later part in my series when we do the AI Builder. Um, the other piece um, of this that you could do, and I won't be demonstrating, is the kind of payment to bring the whole scenario full circle. I would have the ability to surface some additional um, 
virtual entities out into my portal to allow the vendors to see the invoice details and the payment details once those invoices are processed. And those would require your vendor to be signed up and be um, you know, authenticated into that portal to see that additional information. Um, so, you know, with that particular piece of it, um, another thing that we could do is use a business event um, to trigger to say when that invoice or when that payment is posted to trigger the system to send an email. So I have set up an example of an outbound Power Automate that, you know, is triggered by that business event that I'll be showing you as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch over and dive right into this demo. All right. <clears throat> so um, I am here inside of my uh, finance and operations environment. And where we are going to start off at here is with the, I'm sorry. Um, is with the creation of a new request for quotation. So I'm going to go into my all requests for quotation page. And um, I'm going to go ahead and generate a new one. Um, from yesterday's session, I created some Tech Talk stickers. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, create some um, uh, some more Tech Talk stickers. Um, so um, just like normal, I'm going to create this requisition. I can indicate if this is going to be a purchase rec or a purchase order. I can indicate site and warehouse, but I'm just going to accept my uh, defaults here. But the one thing that I do want to select is a solic solicitation type. So I'll select that and click OK. And then for my example, I'm going to use a category. And then I'll select my procurement category from the drop down box. So I'm going to choose office and desk accessories. And then in my product um, name, I'm going to go ahead and type in Tech Talk CDS stickers. Um, I'll tab on over and make sure that we get a quantity here and a unit of measure. I need 10,000 of these stickers because I know everyone's going to want one. And I'll save my record. And then once it's saved, I can go ahead and send and publish. So once I click on send and publish, I'm asked, you know, I haven't assigned any vendors to this. So this is going to be public. Everyone will be able to see this on my Power Apps portal. All right. So now that I have published this purchase requisition, I can go out to my uh, portal um, and I'll just go back to the home page. So I created again this Power um, Apps portal um, from starting from the partner portal example and then started making updates and changes to it. So I've got a home page with some basic information and some links and buttons to become a vendor and so on. But I added a new page up here for the open RFQs. Uh, so when I click on this page, it brings me to the new page that I created where I can see that open list of bids. So I can see the full list of all of these RFQs and if I uh, tab on over to the second page there you can see my new um, purchase requisition um, and I should have put a document title in here I didn't when I created it but I could actually go back and update that on my request for quotation here so if I wanted to just uh, type something in here tech talk simple CDS and save this again when I come back over to the page, if I refresh this, that change will be reflected here in the site. Um, it takes a second, so I might need to refresh it again, but I'd be able to drill into those details either by clicking on the hyperlink or clicking on the VT details, and that would open up and show me the lines. I also have the ability to register to become a vendor. And so in this particular case, my open bid list that I created here um, is view only. Um, but my request to become a vendor is um, a, an edit form or a create form. So it allows users to actually type some information in. I'm going to go ahead and create a, um, uh, a request to become a vendor here and uh, put in some details here. I'm just uh, creating my um, request to become a vendor. And when I'm ready, I can submit this. You do have the ability from a Power Apps portal standpoint, since this is a public facing page, you could set up a CAPTCHA on this so that um, you don't just get a bunch of hackers like submitting a bunch of random things on your site. So if I go ahead and submit this, 
once I come back over to finance and operations, and if I go into, I saved this one to my favorites, to my prospective vendor registration requests, I can see that prospective vendor that I created um, in the system here. So that request comes through into the system, and then I can use my buttons and my workflows to process that request just like normal. So the next piece of this scenario is really centered around the model driven app. So um, I've opened up my model driven app that I created here um, and um, I've put a number of different things in here. So uh, the first thing I did was I, I put my vendors in. So um, in my particular environment, I'm not syncing all of the vendors from all of the legal entities. You can actually see I'm just syncing DEMF and USP2 um, and I do have the the ability to kind of make changes or updates to these particular uh, vendor details. So for example, if I open up this vendor, let's say I want to change this to a different vendor group, um, I can come in here and change this and say, oh, they're going to be in vendor group 10, or I could update other information on this vendor account. And because I'm using dual right, if I save and close here, that update is going to go back and update finance and operations directly. So this will take a second here while that's kind of thinking. I'll go into, I need to switch companies first, DEMF. Oh, helps if you spell it right. Okay, third time's a charm, DEMF. My company does not want to change. There we go. <laughs> and then I'll go into my all vendors form. And if we pull up that vendor that I um, updated, uh, this US001, you can see that it's now in group 10. Again, if I change it from over here, if I change it back to 50, so if I um, edit this and I want to change it back to 50, um, when I save and close this record, so it was set to 50. Um, if I save this and go back into my model driven app once it's done saving and refresh that page, um, the change will be effective. So and that's that bi-directional um, capability of the um, dual right. So if I refresh this, I should see it go back to 50. So there you can see it's back to 50. Um, so that's the dual right, and, and in my case, right, I enabled dual right, um, and there was already an entity with forms and views, so I didn't have to do anything other than add this um, entity into the sitemap for my model-driven app. I also put my open bids out there so um, you know the buyers could see those open bids. These are the same entities and the same forms and views that I used on the portal site. So um, I can double purpose those and surface them on the portal as well as in my model driven app. But the purchase requisitions is where um, you know I really wanted to target allowing my um, you know, buyers to be able to come out here and very quickly and easily create these. So this is a very simplified view of my purchase requisitions. If I click on one of these, it'll open up the details. You can see the lines on this. So maybe I want to update the, the quantity on here so I can click edit um, and, and let's update this and say I wanted 100 of these instead of 10. If I save and close this, again, this is a virtual entity and much like the dual right, that change will be effective over here. So uh, the difference is that the data is not actually stored in the common data service. So if I switch back over to my finance and operations environment and go to my all purchase requisitions page, I will be able to see that change on the purchase requisition. So this Tech Talk one that I edited, that quantity will be updated to 100. Um, so there you can see that quantity is 100. And if again, if I want to edit this back, um, I could change this. Let's just make it 1,000 now or 10,000. That's fine. And save this record. If I go back to my um, model driven app, those changes will be effective here as well. So if I refresh this, there you can see it's 10,000. And that's because um, this is querying that data real time. 
Um, so I can make those changes on either side. The key difference between what I showed you with vendors and purchase requisitions is that vendors, the data is duplicated. So it's consuming capacity in both my common data service and in finance and operations, whereas my purchase requisitions are only consuming capacity in finance and operations. And there's only logic or business logic inside of finance and operations for this, um, whereas vendors have additional logic and functionality in the common data service. All right. So um, the next piece of this scenario is where I need to start uh, receiving these. And so uh, again, I'm using my um, my data integration uh, um, project to integrate that data. So I'm over in the Power Platform Admin Center now. And if you click on that data integration link on the left hand side, I've created a project here called CDS Tech Talk where I have set up a couple of different entities and done some mapping in there to indicate um, what exactly um, I want to map and obviously from a realistic standpoint, you'd want to map a lot more fields than just these three fields, but I can very quickly and easily do that by just adding a mapping, selecting that field that I want to map to, and then on the flip side, choosing which field on my destination that I want to map to and I can update those mapping types. Um, I'll just go ahead and delete that. In my case, I set this up to um, execute nightly. So if I come over to my scheduling tab, this is where you can see I set this up to run every one day at 1130 p.m. I do have the ability to increase those intervals. It does allow you to go down to minutes um, that um, you um, can see here, I can go down to minutes, but from a best practice and a recommendation standpoint, it's important to note that these jobs take time to run. So even if you set this up to run every one minute, you might think that you're getting something that's near real time, but these jobs often take five minutes or, or more, depending on the volume of data that you're copying. So it would always be behind. Um, it, it takes however long um, it, it takes to run that job. And if you're running it every one minute, it's probably really only going to run like every four to five minutes. Depends on the entity again and the volume of data that you're working with. But it's really intended to be asynchronous um, and not like a running it every single minute type of scenario. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, at this point in our scenario, we're ready to go ahead and start um, processing our invoices. Theoretically, like I would have another integration that's coming back in to bring um, data back in from my, um, my WMS system through data management or some other mechanism. But now we're ready to go ahead and start processing those invoices. So I've got a short video here that I'm going to play that uh, kind of shows you this. So here we are in Power Apps and we're using the AI Builder. Um, we've created a, a model that you know is able to scan and use cognitive services to get that OCR metadata off of my invoices. And here you can see the Canvas app. So we built out a Canvas app that is embedded, um, and you'll see that a little bit later, into finance and operations. And it has a number of pages to this app where you can configure uh, some details for new vendors. Um, it has the pages where you can see the details of the actual vendor invoice. And now we're in finance and operations and you can see we created a new workspace tile that opens up a full page uh, Canvas app. We also embedded it a second way so you can see that um, here. So uh, once this is done, you can see we also put it into a an existing workspace as a tab. So um, by using the kind of white uh, background on the Canvas app and not using any um, special colors, that sort of thing. It gives that um, app the appearance that it it's part of finance and operations and the user can't tell that they're actually using a Canvas app. We'll be diving into this scenario more and talking through exactly how to embed these apps and uh, best practices for designing apps. We'll also talk more about that AI builder in the uh, AI builder portion um, or session later on. So, um, you know, now that I've kind of shown you uh, the the various different aspects here, what I want to do is kind of dissect a little bit and talk about the uh, the different scenarios um, and kind of what I did, how I made this happen. 
Um, so starting out with dual right, um, so you saw, um, you know, just one piece that was using dual right in, in my demo today, but I've also got order to cache set up as well, which I didn't show. Um, but in my case, I um, enabled dual right for the vendor ent entity. So that was a, it's a native entity that's already mapped. Um, out there. It exists in the common data service, so I didn't need to do anything special um, other than enable that entity for mapping. Once I enabled that entity for mapping, um, then I was able to go ahead and um, create my model driven app. Um, in my case, I didn't really need to do much to the views or forms for my vendor entity because it is a native entity in the common data service and already had all of those tabs and fields. So I didn't have to go through the process of designing that form, but I did have to add that entity um, into my sitemap so that it would show up on the navigation of my model driven app. So when you're wanting to build a power app that is using dual write, uh, there's kind of two basic um, steps that you're going to follow. So you're going to have to configure your dual write and then you're going to create that power app. In my case, I did a model driven app, but it could just as easily be a canvas app. So when you're configuring dual write, you'll need to create and link your common data service and then you can start enabling your entity maps. If you um, want to map entities that are custom um, and they aren't part of the out of the box templates that are provided, you can do that as well. Down at the bottom, I've provided links for each of these different steps that are outlined here. So um, how to set up the uh, dual right uh, from LCS or for existing ex environments, and then um, how to enable those entity maps. Once you've done that, then you can start creating your Power App. So when you create your Power App, you're going to need to make a connection to your common data service, the same common data service that you are linking to for um, dual write. And then you can start to design your interface. Um, designing your interface really um, kind of consists of two key steps. One is creating those forms and views, um, which is done from the Power Apps Maker Portal. Um, and then the second piece of that is to uh, create your sitemap, which is the screenshot that you see here on the right, where you need to go in and edit and add those entities and decide kind of what the, the layout of the application will look like. Um, when you're finished, you'll need to save and publish your app. If you don't publish those changes, um, you won't be able to play and actually um, uh, use the app. So it's really important that you remember those steps and the links to do all of those basic steps are included here. So a couple of things to note about dual write and from a do's and don'ts perspective. So when we think about using dual write, we want to use dual write to duplicate data to the common data service or finance and operation when the data is expected by the business logic. If the business logic is not needed in two systems or the business logic is not dependent on the data existing where the business logic lives, you don't need to use dual write. You're just going to be duplicating data and increasing capacity and your costs um, when that data isn't required. Um, many of the customer engagement scenarios like the order to cash um, are great examples of when you should use dual write because there's business logic in Dynamics 365 sales that relies on that business logic in the common data service. And we also rely on the, the business logic and the data inside of finance and operations. It's important to note that you'll want to consider your CDS API limits and multiplexing and orderline SKU requirements if you're planning to use dual write. So if you're using dual write, we do give you an allowance of API limits that are specific, um, you know, that you get an extra 400,000 API calls when you enable dual write with finance and operations, in addition to the API limits that you get with your common data service out of the box. But it's still important, depending on the volume of records that you're going to be integrating with dual write, those API limits do still apply. 
You'll also need to consider multiplexing in those order line SKU requirements. If you're um, pulling into one of the six entities that are outlined in the licensing guide, it might be required that um, you either license the users on both um, the CDS or customer engagement app and in FNO, or that you um, you know, purchase order line SKUs um, so that your production hardware is scaled correctly uh, to support the volume of integrations and data that will be going through it. You'll also need to consider your CDS database size and procure add-ons if needed. So obviously your FNO database um, is needs to be considered as well, but when you use dual write, you are copying that data into the CDS and we'll need to make sure that it is sized correctly based on those needs. Some things not to do with dual write is to use it to duplicate data where your business logic is only needed in one of those systems or where your business logic is going to be added into a Power App or Power Automate. So if you're going to build the business logic into your app, um, then we don't necessarily have a requirement or a dependency on that data existing because I can query that data using virtual entities and that would be a more cost effective way. So, um, you know, consider to only use dual write when that data is really needed by the business logic um, that you're writing. So switching gears to the virtual entities, um, for the demo, there were a number of different things that you saw that were um, specific to um, using virtual entities. So um, I started out by deploying the partner portal sample. Again, you could have installed the solution for the supplier management portal as well. And um, the list of virtual entities that I enabled here, this is not um, all inclusive. There were some additional entities, but uh, the key ones were the vend prospective vendor registration request entity. I also enabled the request for quotation line and header entities for the published, um, perch published um, RFQs. Um, if I wanted to kind of extend that scenario and do my uh, vendor invoice or vendor payments, um, I would need to find the appropriate entities and publish those out as well. Um, on my CDS entities, so each one of these entities that I enabled, um, I needed to create um, new views and new main forms. And you could you could make brand new views or you can edit the existing views. It doesn't really matter which approach you take. In some cases, I edited the existing views and added more fields. Um, when you enable that virtual entity um, in the common data service, um, it creates a view in a form for you. However, it only puts like the key, like whatever the, the key is for the that particular entity into the form and into the view. Um, and oftentimes those keys aren't very useful. Um, so you will pretty much always need to go update your forms and views, but it's a very quick and easy drag and drop experience. Um, once I had done that, um, I was ready to create my portal and my model driven app. So because I deployed the portal at the beginning, I was able to go create a new page uh, for my bids. Um, and in my case, I made a single page and I put the bids and the prospective vendor registration into the same page. Um, basically, when you create those pages um, in the properties pane on the right hand side, you're just selecting the views and forms that you created um, directly in the CDS. Um, and I was using the um, the studio to create mine, which makes that experience easier. And if it's your first time creating a portal, I do strongly recommend using the studio because it's a bit more simplified. When you get more advanced, then you're going to want to go into the kind of the back office side, if you will, of the portal. I mean, you'll have a lot more granular control over the behavior of those pages, the look and appearance. Um, with my model driven app, um, I needed to create the app first um, and then I made a sitemap for the pages because I had already created the views and forms that I wanted on my CDS entity. All I needed to do was add those into my sitemap. So that was a quick and easy process. So when we think about the flows and I, I did two different flows, um, which I actually didn't show, but I've got screenshots here for you that you can see. Um, I have the ability to um, you know, use inbound Power Automates um, with virtual entities. So if you want to do this first, you have to enable your virtual entities um, in the common data service, and then you can create a flow. Once you've created a flow, you'll need to make a connection um, 
to one or more things. Um, so in my case, you'll need to you'll need to add a connection to your common data service. Um, but it's important to note from an inbound perspective that something else needs to be the trigger. So in my case, I did an email. So when an email arrives in a shared inbox, um, I've got a number of different parameters there. I'm pulling those in and saying, oh, go create a record in my virtual entity or, you know, maybe I route that to someone um, to perform uh, a review process, whatever it might be. There's no limit to really what you can do. Um, the, the key is you need a trigger of when something happens and then you can say, um, connect to the common data service and you'll select your virtual entity uh, from the list just like you do any other entity and you'll know it's a virtual entity because it will say MSERP in parentheses at the end. I have um, again put links down here at the bottom for all of the various different steps that would be involved in creating um, a new Power Automate for this. So if you're not familiar, I encourage you to check out the steps, but we'll be talking more about Power Automate and how to create flows in future sessions as well. For the outbound example of the Power Automate um, that was using virtual entities in my example, um, you're going to start by creating a flow and the trigger for your flow is going to be a business event. At this point, um, that business event um, is the finance and operations business event. At some point, we will have new business event capabilities inside of uh, the common data service, but for now you have to use the when a business event occurs in finance and operations. Then the additional steps that you put in here can be really anything you want. In my example, it might be a little bit hard to see, but I parse the JSON, which is pretty typical so that you can kind of get all the, the values that were passed from that business event out. And then in my case, I needed to look up the record to get some additional fields from that CDS entity. So I uh, used a list records um, in ac action in um, Power Automate and filtered that down to just be the vendor invoice and the vendor account that I passed in from that particular vendor. So what I was doing was I was looking up the vendor um, so I could get the email address because the email address isn't stored on the invoice itself and not passed in here. So I needed to look that up and then I set a variable. I initialized a variable um, and then for each invoice uh, email address that I find, I'm looping through those. In my case, I filtered it down so it would only ever find one, but it still, it doesn't know that. So it, it uses an apply to each. And then I send an email to the vendor to whatever email address I looked up and letting them know, hey, we processed your invoice or we processed your payment, whatever you know your business event trigger is. And here's a link to go get to the portal. Again, the links to do that are found here. So some do's and don'ts for your virtual entities. You do want to use virtual entities where your business logic resides in finance and operations. So if all of your logic that you need to execute is over in finance and operations and we don't need to, um, you know, have additional business logic where the data is required in the common data service or in CE, um, virtual entities are a good candidate. Um, you do want to use virtual entities as well when you plan to extend or add business logic in a Power App or Power Automate. So you can put additional business logic in your app or your Automate uh, to tell it, oh, go do this approval process and then go insert a record um, or change the status of a record inside of finance and operations. Um, it's important that you'll want to relate your virtual entities to each other. So if you need to relate one virtual entity to another virtual entity, you'll do that in FNO directly on the entity. So you'll make an extension to that entity or if you've created a brand new entity, um, you can do it directly on there. Those relationships um, are dependent on the actual relationship on the entity. Um, you'll also want to relate virtual entities to other native entities that are in the CDS um, with X++ extensions. So um, right now, this is the only way to do that. Um, there is some new functionality on the roadmap that will um, create a user interface to make this process easier. But as of right now, you need to create an X++ extension if you want to relate a native entity to a virtual entity.
And that's done directly in finance and operations. Some things that you should not do is virtual entities are not a data copy mechanism. It's just querying that data and the data will always reside in FNO. Um, you don't want to use virtual entities when additional data points are needed. So it's not appropriate to um, create, you know, enable a virtual entity and then go into the common data service and add a couple of fields to that entity. Now, if you needed to make a new entity entirely in the CDS that has additional fields um, that are somehow related, you could do that. Just remember, you need to um, relate those uh, native entities to virtual entities via the um, X++ extensions. And we should not attempt to relate one virtual entity to another virtual entity directly in the common data service. All right, so switching gears to the data integrator, um, a couple of things for the demo. So I created a connection, um, which is in my case, I connected to uh, finance and operations and another CDS, but this could have been another source that's supported. So, you know, one of the most common other examples would be like a SQL server. Um, for the next thing I did was I needed to create a project. Um, and in my case, I chose the template that is for FNO to the CDS template. Um, then you can start to create maps. In my case, I mapped the products, the purchase order header and purchase order lines with a handful of fields. Obviously, you can map as many entities and uh, fields as are needed for your particular integration. And then you'll set up that scheduling. In my case, I set up that execution to be a nightly recurrence. So th the basic steps, the six steps are making the connection set, the project, selecting the template, mapping your entities, mapping your fields, and then configuring the recurrence. The links to do each of those steps are provided down here um, at the bottom. And I've also provided a link for error management and troubleshooting. So if you do run into errors or problems with your data integrator, you can uh, use this uh, resource to help you troubleshoot um, any mapping errors or issues that you might have with your data integrator. A couple of do's and don'ts for your data integrator. Um, you absolutely should use it as an integration approach. It's intended for large volumes of data that do need to be copied to another system. Um, it's not appropriate to use data integrator when you need near real time or synchronous processing. If you need near, near real time or synchronous processing, you're going to want to look to another technology. If you have high volumes, uh, dual write may not be the right answer, so you may need to look at doing something else with like an Azure service bus um, or some other technology, a, a, a real-time web service or something like that. Um, obviously, your business requirements will dictate what's most appropriate, but these are the considerations that you'll want to make. So the key takeaways, if you uh, fell asleep halfway through my uh, demo or my presentation, the three thing or four things that you need to remember is dual write, data integrator, and virtual entities are meant to coexist. None of these features are replacing each other. And you can use dual write when the business logic relies on the existing data and you intend to copy that data. You're going to use your data integrator for your high volume scenarios and the virtual entities are there to query and perform those CRUD operations with FNO and the business logic just exists in FNO. Uh, that wraps up what I wanted to share with you today. Um, I do encourage you to make sure that you're registered for the upcoming sessions. Uh, I've got the next four up here on the screen for you that are happening over the next month or so. And with that, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Okay, so it looks like um, we do have a question. What's the difference between the vendor collaboration portal, which already exists in FNO, and the one that is available through Power Portal? Um, great question. So um, the vendor collaboration portal, the user, it's important to note the user interface of that um, is actually the finance and operations user interface, and we're surfacing various forms inside of FNO to those users. Uh, it only supports authenticated users, so um, um, uh, you have to have a user account to be able to log in and use those vendor portal capabilities. There is no concept of a public portal. What I demonstrated for you today um, was primarily around the public portal portion of that. So um, you could, and, and it's also important to note that um, 
the portal that I demonstrated for you today is not an out of the box solution. I actually built that. So I deployed the partner portal and then I, um, you know, started editing and tweaking that to make it into a vendor portal. The supplier management portal that's available as a solution out there is also available. It has some additional capabilities, but those are just samples. They're not like fully um, baked solutions um, that have end-to-end -end capabilities. So you'll, you'll need to do customization to uh, those portals no matter what. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, do we have any other questions that have not been answered that we need to address, Jeff, or questions that um, came up that we maybe did answer that we want to review? Yeah, uh, one of the common questions that's come up is which entities are available through virtual entity? Uh, it's all the entities in finance and operations that are marked as is public equals yes. So in finance and operations, that's how you control whether or not an entity is available to owe data. And basically all the entities that are available to OData by having is public equals yes set on them, those are the ones that show up for virtual entity. I'll note that I say virtually all of them because there are a couple of minor exceptions that are documented on docs.microsoft.com. Uh, for instance, you couldn't use a entity which is backed by a union view in FNO through virtual entity because there's no proper ID field on those entities. Uh, there's no way to uniquely identify uh, records that come out of it. So there's a couple of those real edge cases that knock out like 1% of the entities is not being available. But the vast majority of the OData entities are usable through virtual entity. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I saw another one that was asking about additional licensing costs um, to stand up a CDS environment if you already have a FinOps subscription. Um, so if you already have finance and operations, one common data service is included with your licensing. Um, you can deploy that. If you don't have one already, you can deploy that directly through LCS. Um, if you need a second CDS, um, you know, for development or testing purposes, which is generally recommended. Um, you, you don't want to just have a production CDS and no other CDSs uh, if you're doing uh, a lot of development uh, work there. Um, you can procure additional common data service uh, capacity uh, through the add-on SKU, um, and you can work with your partner or your license reseller to, to get more information on that. Another question which has been asked a couple of times is about application lifecycle management and how we deal with multi-instance uh, and things like that. Broadly, what we would guide people there is think of your CDS and FNO environments as converging into a single environment. Uh, so a lot of the gestures you can do, like a lot of the ALM, a lot of the management of the environment is converging around a one-to-one -one view of an environment. So don't think of this where you would have a CDS hub with a bunch of FNO spokes or vice versa. An environment over time becomes an environment that just happens to have a bunch of applications uh, installed in that environment. And in addition to that, if you wanted to then integrate multiple environments together, that's where things like data integrator become a tool that you would want to look at doing more of an arm's length integration between multiple environments. Another question came in, if we develop any solution as portal using virtual entities, will there be any license issue from D365 finance and operations? Um, so th there's a lot of caveats to this question. Uh, it depends on what you're building your portal to do. If you create a portal for your call center users to submit sales orders, um, to create sales orders because you want to make a more simplified user interface, for example, those users would need to be licensed for finance and operations. That would be a multiplexing scenario. If you're building a portal like the example that we looked at today for vendors um, to be external, um, you know, that does not fall under a multiplexing scenario and, um, you know, your vendors are not required to be licensed, um, you know, for the portal. But if you have vendors that are logging into your system to 
act on behalf of your organization, um, like consultants or something like that, that uh, you contract them out through a vendor and they're going to be updating projects and doing timesheets and other things like that, that would also fall under a multiplexing scenario. I would encourage you to consult with the licensing guide and talk with your partner and your licensing reseller um, or your sales specialist at Microsoft. They can definitely give you more details about your specific scenario to let you know if there's a conflict. Uh, you know, it, it's really going to come down to uh, multiplexing and dual use rights um, type scenarios. There's a question about being able to use virtual entities in customer engagement dashboards. Uh, yes, that is a scenario that's fully supported. That's actually one of the key drivers for why we have uh, enabled virtual entity, both within uh, model driven apps or UCI apps on CDS, uh, as well as canvas based apps, the more traditional power apps. You can mix and match both native entities from CDS as well as virtual entities from finance and operations. Uh, we have a number of scenarios where uh, various partners and customers are doing things where you'll start from some native entities like looking at your accounts and contacts, which may have been dual written from FNO over to CDS and then drill deeper into, say, some transactional information related to those accounts and contacts via virtual entity so that you can view some of that transactional information, which is so verbose that you would never be able to copy it back and forth with dual right. So in these ways, uh, both dual right and virtual entity are com complementary and compatible technologies that light up additional scenarios when you use them together. All right, I think we have time for one last question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, do we have any free version of CDS available for developer to explore? Um, there is a trial um, version of the common data service that you can sign up for. The link for that is in the appendix of our PowerPoint deck, uh, but a quick internet search should also probably land you on that page as well if you want to get started on that immediately. So you can sign up for those trial environments. They're good for 30 days um, and then you can start playing around with it. Um, with that, I, I thank everyone again for, for joining us today, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Evan to wrap us up. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, we'd like to get your feedback on today's session. I've posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We value your feedback and welcome your input on how we did today and what you would like to see in future sessions. The survey scores on a scale from one to five, with five being the highest score possible, and we thank you for your participation in that. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter and to our and a thank you to our audience for logging in and joining us today. Please stay safe and have a great rest of your day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.